Hello, wonderful staff of the Northwest TV Center. Welcome to the spring edition of our monthly dialysis in-service. So you've all heard many times that the number one cause of death among dialysis patients is cardiovascular. So people die of heart attacks and strokes. Today, we're going to talk about the second most common cause of death among dialysis patients. That is stopping dialysis. Uh, withdrawal of dialysis means the discontinuation of maintenance dialysis. Uh, and this is becoming a more important and more frequent issue that's confronting both nephrologists and dialysis staff. Um, and there are a lot of reasons for this. Uh, part of the fact is uh, people are starting to recognize the importance of end-of-life issues among uh, patients and also the need for a potential balance between like the burden and benefit of dialysis and the uh, Dallas patient population is becoming older with a lot more comorbidities. Um, and it's a complex issue um, with many layers of ethical, uh, psychosocial, and cultural issues. There are three objectives to today's talk. Understand who is more likely to stop dialysis, which groups and what are the predictors. Understand common reasons for stopping dialysis and appreciate the nature of ongoing care after stopping dialysis. Today's talk will assume a question and answer format, so I will present a number of questions and then we will discuss their answers. Question number one, is withdrawal from maintenance and dialysis common? The answer is yes. So globally, rates of dialysis withdrawal have been increasing. Uh, in the dialysis population, withdrawal from maintenance dialysis uh, is now the second most common cause of death after cardiovascular disease while in previous years it was third following infectious disease. So in the United States in 2020, 17% of hemodialysis and approximately 16% of patients on perineal dialysis withdrew from dialysis before death. Question number two, what are common reasons why people stop dialysis? Uh, there are many. So for example, severe pain that cannot be managed with medications, uh, in whom dialysis patients uh, may prolong life for a short period of time, but will also prolong suffering. Uh, patients with multiple organ system failure that persist despite intensive therapy, such as um, liver failure, heart failure, metastatic cancer, etc. cetera. Uh, the development of mental incapacity such that dialysis cannot be performed safely. So for example, dialysis patients who develop dementia or uh, become combative and can't lie still with needles in their arm. Patients who have a limited life expectancy, say, an expected death within 60 days due to cancer or you know, liver, lung, heart disease, or other illness that dialysis will not change. Question number three, are certain groups of people more likely to stop dialysis than others? And the answer, of course, is yes. Um, so for example, uh, older patients, so patients over the age of 85, are more likely to discontinue dialysis prior to death you know, than, say, younger patients. So you can look at about uh, a third of dialysis patients over the age of 85 choose to stop dialysis as opposed to only 11% under the age of 44. Um, white patients are more often inclined to stop dialysis than uh, Blacks or Hispanics or Asian Americans or Native Americans. For reasons that are unclear, females are more likely to withdraw from dialysis compared with males. Uh, patients uh, with multiple medical problems, uh, such as frequent hospitalizations, severe pain, cancer, severe debility, are more likely to stop dialysis. Um, patients who are depressed uh, are more likely to stop dialysis. Those who are divorced or widowed, um, interestingly, being on hemodialysis rather than perineal dialysis is a risk factor for stopping dialysis. And finally, uh, higher education level. Those who obtain higher education status uh, are more likely to stop dialysis. Question number four, can a dialysis patient stop dialysis if he or she wants to? And the answer is of course, yes. Uh, so patients have a legal right to stop dialysis because they are not obligated to accept medical care. Um, the decision to accept or decline therapy uh, legally resides in the patient. It's not with the family or the clinician. Uh, and essentially all patients have a personal legal right to determine what is best for them uh, and be able to make informed decisions, including the decision to decline uh, a life-prolonging treatment such as dialysis. 
So this was codified by something called the Patient Self-Determination Act, which is approved by Congress uh, to encourage the completion of something called advanced directives, which we'll talk about. Essentially, it supports the legality of a decision to withdraw a life-sustaining treatment, such as dialysis. And this right is based upon the presumption of something called informed consent. So informed consent uh, relates to something called decisional capacity. So the capacity to make decisions uh, medically and legally. Uh, this involves, first, full disclosure to the patient about the nature of the illness and all aspects of therapy options. The uh, patient needs to be able to express understanding uh, the consequences of decision regarding continuation dialysis or stopping dialysis and needs to be able to make a decision without undue influence. So to demonstrate um, informed consent and decisional capacity, the dialysis patients need to be able to articulate that they understand they have kidney failure, express understanding that they will die if they stop dialysis and make that decision without duress. Now, if a dialysis patient asks to stop dialysis and has decisional capacity, like we just talked about, so can make a good, sound medical decision, how should dialysis staff respond? So, a first step is to find out why they want to stop dialysis. And this should ideally be addressed by all members of the dialysis team. So, nephrologist, nurse, social worker, technician, dietitians, whoever's involved in their care, ideally should ask them why they want to stop dialysis. It's important to understand the patient's unique circumstances that led him or her to choose withdrawal from dialysis because sometimes these circumstances can be corrected or otherwise addressed. Um, it's necessary to address any potential remedial factors contributing to the decision, like treatable pain or depression. Now, some patients consider withdrawal because of what we consider to be irremediable factors, you know, like severe debility, um, repeated dialysis access failures, loss of limbs, loss of eyesight, basically a number of you know, severe medical conditions. But other people contemplate withdrawal because of potentially reversible factors. And some of these factors can be things like they don't like the pain with needle insertion, or they have frequent muscle cramps, uh, or other physical or psychological symptoms of advanced illness. Um, additionally, inadequate social concerns or supports about you know, being a burden to loved ones also may prompt patients to request withdrawal of dialysis, and these issues can potentially be addressed. Uh, it's really important to make sure that the patient is fully informed regarding the decision to stop dialysis. That is, make sure he or she has informed consent and specifically understands that death will follow dialysis cessation. Uh, and finally, make sure that depression isn't playing a role, a role. So there's clearly a high prevalence of depression in the dialysis population, and depressive symptoms are associated with higher rates of dialysis withdrawal. Now, it doesn't mean that a dialysis patient who's depressed can't legally you know, withdraw uh, from dialysis, but it's very important to you know, certainly try to address and treat the depression uh, that uh, led them to bringing up the idea of stopping dialysis. In contrast, if patients do not have decisional capacity to make decisions for themselves, can they stop dialysis? Well, the first thing to do is figure out whether or not the loss of decisional capacity is transient or permanent. Uh, transient uh, loss of uh, decisional capacity could be something like uremia, or it could be due to medications, or delirium from other illness. Uh, and if we can address these issues, uh, sort out their medicines, support them over time, a lot of time medical status improves uh, such that decisional capacity is restored. In contrast, if the decisional capacity is permanent, uh, then we have to look for a previously completed advanced directive. So an advanced directive is a document in which the patient has either detailed his or her desires concerning future care in the event of them becoming incompetent, or has identified a surrogate health agent, so a healthcare proxy who knows what the patients want and can do what the patient wants uh, in the event that he or she is not able to speak um, for himself. We also have in Washington State, as well as other states, something called a POST form, a physician's order for life-sustaining treatment. Basically, it's a two-page form which details what sort of care a patient would want uh, or be willing to receive under certain unfortunate circumstances. You know, like let's say they had a cardiac arrest, would they want CPR? They couldn't eat, would they want to be supported with tube feeds? If they had kidney failure, would they want dialysis? 
Um, <clears throat> usually, it's appropriate to withdraw dialysis in patients who do not have decisional capacity if they have explicitly written and made it clear in the past that they would not want dialysis and other life-sustaining treatments under certain circumstances such as dementia. Uh, it's also appropriate to withdraw dialysis in patients who lack decisional capacity and don't necessarily have an advanced directive, but have well-known, well-established beliefs um, that would be inconsistent with dialysis and could be verified by a healthcare surrogate or proxy. So for example, a spouse or child, if they knew yet, no, it's no way that my husband or my dad would uh, want dialysis, then uh, under those circumstances, it's reasonable to stop dialysis. Is stopping dialysis considered suicide? Uh, so there's a misconception about dialysis withdrawal uh, is that uh, it is a form of voluntary euthanasia or assisted dying or suicide. Uh, this is erroneous. Um, in assisted dying, the direct cause of death is administration of a medication or other intervention. Now, by contrast, um, the cause of death in dialysis withdrawal is just renal failure, um, which has been allowed to proceed along its natural course in the absence of a machine that was previously cleaning the blood. This is supported uh, by most religious organizations. For example, the Catholic Church considers it acceptable to withdraw or withhold extraordinary therapies, including dialysis, um, if they are only merely prolonging survival with an unacceptably poor quality of life uh, and minimal therapeutic benefit. How long do patients live if they stop dialysis? The mean survival following dialysis withdrawal is seven to 10 days, although rarely it can be weak, and it tends to be longer in patients who still have what we call residual renal function, that is, they still make urine. Um, but overall, 70% of the patients die within 10 days, 28% die within 10 to 30 days, 2% die within 30 and 100 days, and 1% die after 100 days. What symptoms? might a dialysis patient develop after stopping dialysis? Well, essentially you can develop symptoms of renal failure. So when the waste products accumulate in the blood, they can make you sick, and this can cause nausea, loss of appetite. Um, kidneys normally remove fluid, and so if you don't have kidney function, you tend to retain fluid that causes swelling, and potentially can cause shortness of breath. Uh, uremic toxins make people feel very, very tired, they're drowsy, they want to sleep all day long, and ultimately they lead to confusion. Um, people then eventually fall asleep and they don't wake up. So the way that people die of kidney failure is they die by falling asleep and not waking up. Do dialysis patients have a choice as to where they die? Uh, the answer is maybe. Um, if sufficient support can be arranged, uh, many patients are able to pass away at home. Otherwise, uh, they may need to be placed in a care facility such as an adult family home or a nursing home for their final days of life. What does comfort care mean? After dialysis has been withdrawn, attention should be directed towards the comfort of the patient. Comfort care is a patient care plan that is focused on symptom control, pain relief, and quality of life. So for example, uh, if a patient is short of breath, we give them supplemental oxygen. Um, again, focusing on quality of life, we remove most of the dietary restrictions associated with dialysis. We can let them eat fruit and yogurt and cheese and whatever they want to eat. Uh, the exception is we generally try to maintain a fluid restriction because uh, that can minimize the potential for swelling and shortness of breath. Shortness of breath can be uncomfortable, and so in gen we generally encourage our patients to minimize fluid intake uh, so that they don't develop shortness of breath. Also, during a period of comfort care, we focus on um, other issues that are important, emotional, spiritual, social bereavement issues. Uh, and to that aim, hospice, which we'll talk about shortly, is very helpful. Can patients who stop dialysis change their minds? Uh, the answer is yes. Uh, dialysis patients can resume dialysis if they change their mind, but they don't have a long window uh, of time to do this. In other words, if you've not dialyzed for five or six days, then you tend to become confused. And if you're confused, then you lose decisional capacity. So you can change your mind uh, for sure, but you have a narrow window of time to do that. 
can take you stop dialysis in opposition to family wishes. Yes, ultimately it's the patient's decision. Now, nephrologists should encourage the patient to fully inform their significant others, family or caregivers of the decision to withdraw from dialysis and of course the consequences that accompany such a decision since it affects so many people. However, it's not an ethical or legal requirement and on rare occasion there are some patients who prefer to maintain their privacy for various reasons. Ideally, uh, supportive family members or caregivers should be allowed to fully participate in and uh, ask questions so they can comprehend the decision. Um, similarly, when a surrogate has been appointed, uh, so a power of attorney, um, this individual should be fully involved in the decision-making process. Question number 15, can someone be assigned to make decisions for a patient if he or she loses the ability to do so? So yes, uh, this is a very important thing. Ideally, we want the person who is discontinuing dialysis to assign someone the role of medical power of attorney, also called durable power of healthcare, or healthcare proxy, or healthcare surrogate. Uh, so that's just the smoothest way. If, if the person who's stopping dialysis identifies someone who can make decisions for him or herself, we can formalize it uh, with a legal document, the durable power of health attorney for healthcare, uh, then there are no problems. Um, you know, if the person doesn't assign someone uh, and has relatives, then typically it becomes a spouse who is first in line to make decisions, and children, uh, and then other family members. So uh, ideally, again, we want the person who's stopping dialysis to identify a healthcare proxy. So what should a dialysis patient do if he or she decides to stop dialysis? Well, several just practical things that uh, we want to help our patients with first. Encourage a patient to make a will if not already done. That's a, a huge boon to uh, any errors that this person has, uh, and it sorts out a lot of potential conflict uh, in the future. Ideally, sign an advanced directive to have a living will, also called durable healthcare power of attorney or healthcare proxy, uh, complying with state law. So, in other words, identify someone who can make decisions for you. Uh, because eventually these people get really, really sleepy and confused and in the final days and hours they can't make decisions. So it's good to have one person who's in charge of making decisions. Um, <clears throat> and again, to that end, the person who's stopping dialysis should identify a durable power of attorney. And it's not just for medicine, but it's for a legal, uh, financial, banking, business matter. So you can have power of attorney for many aspects of your life. And it doesn't have to be the same person. You can have a medical power of attorney be one person and, you know, legal or banking power of attorney, you know, uh, take care of financial matters. Um, ideally, we encourage the patient to record their assets for their beneficiaries, you know, so if they, uh, you know, have any financial accounts, stocks, real estate, business records, whatever it is, it's good to sort that out, you know, prior to the person's passing. It just makes the, uh, the heir's life a lot easier. Uh, it's good to compile a list of names, addresses, telephone numbers of you know, attorney, accountant, family members, loved ones, business uh, associates, friends, whoever should be notified you know, of your death. Um, and of course, it's a good idea for the patient who's you know, stopping dialysis to identify uh, you know, funeral plans uh, and memorial service plans just so that the loved ones who are remaining don't have to do that. Completely optional, but a good idea is for that person to either write a letter or have a video or already tape message to family members and other loved ones, um, you know, while they are still coherent and can communicate with them. What care is available to dialysis patients after they stop treatment? Well, the one word you need to know about is hospice. A hospice is a type of health care that focuses on the palliation of a terminally ill patient's pain and symptoms uh, while attending to their emotional spiritual needs at the end of life. So essentially it prioritizes comfort and quality of life by reducing pain and suffering. It provides an alternative to medical therapies that are focused on life prolonging measures, you know, such as dialysis uh, or other medical interventions. Uh, particularly if the patients uh, find these treatments very difficult and not necessarily aligned with their overall goal. Uh, fortunately, it's covered by Medicare and most insurances for patients with a terminal disease whose life expectancy is less than six months. Uh, now, stopping dialysis does allow a brief window of time for patients to communicate with loved ones to come to terms with their life. So, 
Hospice is uh, an excellent uh, service that we offer to all of our patients who decide to stop dialysis. Finally, it enables people to die at home rather than the hospital or intensive care unit. Okay, now let's review what we learned today. Withdrawal of maintenance dialysis is becoming more common. It's now the second most common cause of death among dialysis patients. Uh, there are many medical indications for considering withdrawal of dialysis. Um, for example, severe pain or other suffering is not medically managed. Uh, patients with multi-organ failure, such as liver failure or heart failure. Uh, patients with irreversible mental incapacitation, such as dementia, that interferes with their ability to understand or safely participate in dialysis. And patients who have a limited life expectancy, um, say less than 60 days because of cancer or other problem, uh, in which dialysis will not change. Um, competent adult patients have the right to decline Medicare. So anyone who's on dialysis has the legal right to stop dialysis whenever he or she wants. So it's a good idea to identify the reason for withdrawal and make sure that it's not a modifiable factor. For example, uh, depression or some other problem that can be addressed to make dialysis more tolerable. It's very important to make sure that patients have the capacity to make decisions for themselves. That is, that they can identify the problem, be familiar with treatment options, and know the consequences of those treatment options, including uh, the, the certainty of death if they stop dialysis. Uh, very important that patients discuss uh, stopping dialysis with family members. Um, average survival is 7 to 10 days of stopping dialysis, um, and it's very important to offer hospice to patients who are stopping dialysis. Okay, now let's turn to the worst part of the talk, which is the quiz to assess whether or not you've actually been paying attention. Question number one, what are the first and second most common causes of death among dialysis patients? Excellent. So, number one cause of death among dialysis patients is cardiovascular, so patients die of heart attacks and heart failure and stroke. Uh, the number two cause now is withdrawal of dialysis, followed by number three, infection. Question number two, is it legal for an adult dialysis patient in this country to stop dialysis for any reason? The answer is, of course, yes, as long as patients have decision of Question number three, what service should be offered to dialysis patients when they stop treatment? So again, hospice is a wonderful service that's covered by Medicare and most insurances uh, that provides uh, comfort care uh, and home support for uh, patients who uh, have a terminal illness such as renal failure. Question number four names three medical reasons why dialysis patients often consider stopping treatment. Excellent. Severe pain or other suffering that cannot be medically managed. Patients with multi-organ failure, such as liver or heart disease. Patients with dementia and other forms of mental capacitation that interfere, interferes with their ability to understand or safely participate in dialysis. Uh, patients who have limited life expectancy, say they've got metastatic cancer, they've got um, short-term survival, uh, and dialysis uh, cannot favorably impact that. Question number five, what is the average length of time patients live after stopping dialysis? That's right, seven to ten days. So not long, 
Again, patients can change their mind if they want, but they have a very narrow window of opportunity to do that because confusion follows. This concludes the May 2023 in-service for the Northwest Kidney Center. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you for your excellent care of our patients along their entire journey uh, from the beginning until the end when many of them will choose to stop dialysis. This is Andy Brokenbo signing out until next month. Have a great uh, rest of your month.